Okay, good morning and welcome back to the third lecture. In the last session, we saw how C programs could be written to execute instructions conditionally and thereby we could solve many problems which required alternate execution of either one group of instructions or another group of instructions depending upon a certain condition. We of course also saw the details about the data types, uh, the computations, the precedences of operators and also the kind of comparisons that can be made. You will remember that we looked at a problem of finding out the maximum of given numbers. At that time I had suggested that this is a precursor to introduce the notion of iteration. I have always found it useful to introduce a new notion through a need which is exemplified by some example which we have attempted to solve using the concepts learned so far. So, we will in this session discuss the problem of finding maxima of given numbers. In the process we will discuss instructions for specifying iteration using for and using while. More specifically we will consider the problem of estimating value of the natural logarithm of a given number x and if time permits we will discuss the general problem of finding roots of a polynomial. However, I believe we might terminate today's session by just looking at the estimation uh, problem for logarithm x. Uh, essentially throughout this session we are going to uh, emphasize the use of iteration in different forms. So, here we go we relook at the problem which we had earlier seen namely finding out maxima of given numbers. I have reproduced the program that we had written uh, or portion of the program that we had written to find out the maxima of five numbers. And I have said here that I can read the five values as a, b, c, d and e and then starting with the first number and artificially calling it maximum because that is the only number that we have seen and clearly that is the maximum of the numbers that we have seen so far. We then compare subsequent numbers b, c, d and e with the max and whenever we find any number to be greater than max, we replace the present value of max by that number. This is a common sense algorithm, most people will understand it, we output the maximum value there. The question was what do we do if the number of numbers is very large? We actually asked two questions last time, one in the number of numbers is very large, for example 200 numbers, clearly it is not very proper to expect somebody to write a program with 200 variables or 1000 variables. More importantly, if the number of numbers itself is different every time the program is executed, then there is no clear way as to how we could write a program to satisfy that requirement. This is where we now say that we will study this particular pattern of giving instructions and see what else we can do in order to modify our instruction giving mechanism. And then we will seek whether the programming language that we use namely C programming language does it have any features which permit us to control the execution of instruction other than the simple sequence and other than the simple conditional execution. So, first we look at a possible strategy. Going back to the previous slide we notice that there is a very similar instruction that is being executed again and again and again. Here it is b greater than max, max equal to b, c greater than max, max equal to c, d greater than max, max equal to d. We notice that b, c, d, e, etc. are nothing but the numbers which we are evaluating to find out which is the maximum. Consequently, I can generalize this by saying that I observe or I notice a repetitive pattern in our program which says if number is greater than max, then max equal to number. This number is a different number every time. In short, what I am looking for is if I could force a repetitive execution of this instruction with different value for a number every time this instruction is executed, then perhaps I would be able to find out the maximum of all the numbers that have been given to me. So, this is the observation, the possible strategies if we could execute this instruction repeatedly every time with a different value of number, we will get the desired result. Now, how do we ensure that the comparison is made with a new value every time? Well, in the earlier program, we had read all possible values given to us at one time. Let us go back to the previous slide. 
notice that here we had said C in A, B, C, D, E and then we were comparing each of these values with the current maximum and so on. Instead, we now observe that if we want to repeatedly execute some pattern, then perhaps a better pattern is I read a number and then I compare it with the current value of max. If this number is greater than the current value of max, I replace the maximum current value by this number. And you will notice that if I can repeatedly execute these two statements, every time get a new number, find out if it is larger than the current max, if it is replace the value of max. So, if I execute it say 10 times, then up to then I would have read 10 numbers and the current maximum of those 10 would have been stored in max. As I continue to read more numbers, every time the max will be updated provided I find a number which is larger than the current max. In short, repeating this particular pattern of instructions again and again and again till the desired number of numbers have been compared and I have found the maximum seems to be a sure short way. At this stage, I would like to voice this strategy in words in what we call an algorithm description, not necessarily in the programming language. Of course, we will use some constructs from C programming language that we understand, but effectively if we repeat this block five times, we will find the maximum of five numbers. There is a problem there. If I go back to the previous slide, I can execute this any number of times, but imagine when I am executing for the first time. For the first time I come here, I read a number, fair enough. Then I come to the next instruction, it says is number greater than max. Well, subsequently max will have some value, but for the first time max will have no value. Now to make this comparison meaningful, I must have some initial value for max. That is what I have noted on the next slide here, that I need an initial value for max. Now, the initial value could actually be any arbitrary value which is lower than all actual numbers that I will subsequently give. For example, if we assume that all the given numbers are positive, that means 0 or more, then we could assign an arbitrary negative initial value to max because the first very first number that comes from the real life as input will be larger than any negative number and that would become the value of max at that point and subsequently the comparisons will proceed as we desire. So, expanding our strategy inwards, what we wish to say is something like this, max is equal to say minus 999. This is actually an artificial arbitrary value and this presupposes that all given numbers are positive. Then I want to say something like this, repeat the following block five times, C in greater greater number, if number greater than max, max equal to number. Do I have an instruction which can make this particular block of instructions repeat five times? It so happens that C programming language like most other programming languages provide for such iterative execution of identified block of instructions. Effectively, we need a counting mechanism. Every time we execute this block, we want to increment the count by one. So, let us say we want to count this as one, two, three, four, five and whenever fifth time the block is executed, we want to terminate our execution. There is an instruction in C called for instruction which provides such mechanism. This is the syntax of the for statement which we can explain to our students. In fact, when you explain you might want to draw a flow chart, but what I have found is that the previous statement in the words which I have given, repeat this block five times is often adequate for students to understand. Here we say for count equal to one, count less than equal to five, count plus plus. C in greater greater number, if number greater than max, max equal to number. This block is being executed repeatedly is the purpose of the for statement. At this stage we can explain to our students that we are sort of counting the number of times the block is executed. So, there is an initial value to the count which is 1. Then there is an increment to the count after every execution. So, count is set to count plus 1 and finally, this will continue as many times till the condition count less than equal to 5 is reached. We are very briefly explaining the semantics or meaning of the for statement. So, effectively inverse we will say that the computer will start with count equal to 1, execute this block once. 
add 1 to the count, count will become 2, execute it again, count is 3, execute it again, count is 4, execute it again. At every re-execution, it will keep comparing the current value of count with the final value that we are given. When count is equal to 5, since it satisfies less than equal to 5, the block will still be executed. But when the count is incremented later, count will become 6, this condition will not be valid and we will come out of this so called for loop. Essentially then, this for statement of the programming language permits me an extremely easy way to set up a finitely countable number of times that I want to repeat the execution of a block. There are other considerations. For example, I may say that my values could be either positive or negative, in which case clearly the initial value of max equal to minus 999 is not correct. Why is it not correct? Suppose I want to find out the maximum of 5 numbers, all of which are negative and all of which are smaller than minus 99. So, one value is minus 10,000, minus 20,000, minus 5,000, minus 7,000, etc., etc. The maximum of them is clearly the least negative value. But minus 999 turns out to be larger than all of them. Then what will happen? I may read all those 5 numbers, all of which are large negative numbers as I said. But since max is initially set to minus 999, this program will produce a result where the max will be still minus 999, which is not a correct value. How do I account for this particular problem? The suggestion here is that the artificial value is not a good idea anyway. As I said, what if we are given negative numbers also or in fact only negative numbers? So a better thing would be that since the maximum is to be found amongst the given numbers and since numbers are being given to me one by one, the best thing is take the first number and call it the maximum. After all, that is what we did in our earlier version of the program. We set max to A, which was the first number that we read and then compared max with B, C, D, E, etc., etc. Why not we do the same strategy? We read one number separately, assign it to max. Now we read second number onwards, all the remaining numbers and continue with our repeated execution of that comparison. Consequently, I will have to iterate the loop if I am finding out the maximum of 5 numbers only 4 times because the first number has already been taken care of. So, here is the general instruction then C in number max equal to number. The first number comes into the location for number and it is assigned to max. Now, I set up the iteration for count equal to 1, 2 and including 4. So, this execute this iteration will be executed 4 times. Every time a number will be read compared with the max and max will be reset if we want to. This is a very clean mechanism because the maximum number that we so find will always be amongst the numbers which have been given to me since there is no artificial initialization of max at the beginning. We can extend this to write a program which will find maximum of n given numbers where n itself is variable. Observe that earlier we said that it is impossible to write a program by using explicit variables to represent individual numbers. But once we have a single variable representing a number and we keep reading a new value or a new number in the same variable, then we can handle any number of numbers. So, look at the program which so results. Program says program 4 to find maximum of n given numbers, int count number n max and I read the value of n. Now, somebody executing the program might want to find maximum of 200 numbers. Somebody else might want to find maximum of 100 numbers. Somebody else still might want to find maximum of 7 numbers. Whatever is the purpose, when this program is executed, the number of numbers will be read as input. So, if I want to find out the maximum of 100 numbers, I will give n as 100. Now, observe how the algorithm works. I will first read the first number, which is as per my previous strategy and assign it to max. Now, I will run the repeated execution of this block which I had already identified not n times, but n minus 1 times because the first number I have already read. Consequently, I read the first number, assign it to max, then I read the remaining n minus 1 numbers one by one, c in greater greater number and every time I compare that with the current max, reassign the max if I so wish, if, if the comparison uh, so indicates and when I come out therefore, I would have found out the maximum of n numbers. This or very similar example is useful to emphasize to the students 
that without an iterative control structure, we will be unable to solve many real life problems of this and similar type. Observe that from a teaching perspective, an important aspect of teaching this is not just the syntax and semantics of for and why statement, but to lead to the need for such a statement by showing an example that I took for example, finding out maximum of 5 numbers and 7 numbers and what happens when I want to find out maximum of larger numbers, thus identifying a repeatable block of instructions and then decide, designing or constructing an algorithm which actually takes that into account. Of course, uh, you can construct any other similar example, but my submission is please try to take an example which can be solved partially using the constructs of conditional, but if you want to really extend it or generalize it, you will not be able to do that without having an iterative control. This, the, this is one example which I found to be very straightforward, simple and meaningful and therefore, I use this to introduce the iteration. Of course, having said this, now we can go ahead and describe other details about the iteration. For example, this is the general format and semantics of the for statement. So, there are four components of the for statement. I have called them just arbitrarily as xxx, yyy, zzz and www. So, what are these? xxx is an initialization thing. So, we say it must be an assignment statement. We call it loop initialization. yyy is the terminal condition. So, uh, the condition is evaluated every time the loop is executed. Loop test is what is the name that we give to y y. What is z z z? z z is the loop increment and w w w is the set of statements which we have identified which need to be repeatedly executed. What we have tried to do here, incidentally this slide uh, comes from uh, the slides that are prepared for our CS101 course by a colleague of mine. There have been uh, many excellent teachers who preceded me teaching this CS101 and in IIT we usually use the better ideas and slides of our colleagues. I mentioned to you yesterday that the objective here is not only these slides, but such slides and other learning teaching material that any one of you has created out of passion and you have tested it could be put together and all of us could use them. More specifically, I would like to put on record uh, the use of material prepared by Professor Sudarshan, Professor Sharad Chandran, uh, notably Professor Abhiram Ranade who was our head till last year and Professor Milin Soni. So, look at this simple ex explanation of the general format and semantics of the for statement. It gives steps 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The 0 8 step is execute x x x. It must be an assignment statement. So, this says this is first initialization of the loop is carried out by executing this statement. Then it evaluates the condition y y y is the condition valid, is it true, then continue with the next step, otherwise the for statement is terminated. Please note that for statement can therefore terminate without even once executing the body of the loop. Of course, if the condition is true, I will go down to www and the loop body is executed once. After executing it, I do not fall through, but I go back and execute zzz which is the loop increment. And after executing the loop increment, what do I do? Go back and repeat from 1. So, this is the iteration. In this iteration, xxx initialization is outside the iteration. It is done beforehand, much like assigning the initial value to max outside my iteration body. But this is implicitly done by the for statement itself. Remember the statement like count equal to 1 or i equal to 1 or whatever may be the initialization. So, this then is the general, general explanation of how a for statement works. Incidentally, we can also tell our people that loop initialization xxx need not initialize only one variable. It can actually initialize more variables. Subsequently, when we discuss variations of the iteration specification, we will see some very interesting possibilities uh, in which the iteration could be prescribed in a C program. We can extend our previous idea of finding out maximum of n numbers to a something uh, to do something very similar. Find out the sum of first n natural numbers. Please note that the first n natural numbers are very easily defined as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 up to n. Consequently, I do not have to read a number here. I want to keep adding the numbers one by one 
into a sum such that I accumulate the total number, uh, total sum of numbers up to n. I do this repetitively and I form my algorithm exactly the way I formed the algorithm earlier. So, here I have int i n sum equal to 0. Incidentally, an initialization is perfectly possible and valid while you define the data type and the existence of a variable. So, this is a valid statement. Now, I read in the value of n and what is the loop that I set up? For i equal to 1, i less than n, i plus uh, i equal to i plus 1 or i plus plus sum is equal to sum plus one. What is i? i represents actually the number. So, first it is 1, then it is 2, then it is 3, then it is 4, etc., 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 etc. It finds out actually the sum of numbers from 1 to n minus 1 because it will uh, last time it will execute when i is less than n and then c out is sum of n numbers where we just output this state. It is interesting that even in this simple program to execute this with different values of n and to try to determine whether you actually get the correct value of not. Usually, there is some problem or the other in the loop test condition or the increment or the initialization and testing a program with different values is a sure short way of ensuring that we have not missed out on any extreme value there. In fact, I would definitely like you to, of course, you can find out uh, what is the problem with this program, but it is best to run this just like that and see exactly what happens. Next, I would like to quickly discuss another application for iterative execution of instructions. In fact, without iterative execution, we may not be able to solve such problems. This is a problem plumbly in the domain of numerical analysis. Traditionally, numerical analysis courses uh, which are conducted separately will discuss these kind of problems. I believe that it is important for us when we teach computer programming to also discuss these problems because it is only in the context of these problems that computer programming is actually useful to most of our students and as a matter of fact to all of us. So, let us spend some time in discussing how natural logarithm is computed. First of all, we start with the definition. Natural logarithm of x is nothing but a definite integral from 1 to a, a 1 upon x dx. This is well known to our students. All of, all of them know this. This is the formula for log x. But since the computer cannot integrate, it must use arithmetic operations to evaluate this definite integral. How do we evaluate a definite integral? First of all, what is an integral? So, we go back to the basics and say, integral is nothing but area under the curve and if it is an integral between 1 and a, then the area under the curve 1 by x from 1 to a will be the value of this integral from 1 to a and therefore, we can estimate it if we can estimate the integral correctly. So, essentially I have a function f x equal to 1 by x and I want to estimate the area under this curve from 1 to a. Now, the curve itself is not a straight line curve or something obviously, 1 upon x is a is a different kind of curve. So, can we, how do we estimate the area? Well, what we do is, we break the entire area into small rectangles. Now, for a rectangle, we can easily calculate the area of that rectangle and if we have a large number of rectangles approximately representing the area of the uh, curve under consideration, we should be able to get a good enough estimate of the final value which will be very accurate. So, here is some diagrammatic representation of the situation. This process by the way is known as Riemann integral. So, most of you would of course, be familiar with Riemann integrals. I am not sure whether our undergraduate students in first year would be familiar, but nevertheless there is no harm in introducing these terms here. Incidentally, uh, most of you would have read Wikipedia for some purpose or the other. Wikipedia happens to be one of the best resources on technical terms and things as well. Riemann integral for example, is described extremely well in the Wikipedia. So, those students who have not heard of it, but are interested, you can refer them to Wikipedia. You can just open up Wikipedia, search for Riemann and they will find out exactly this kind of uh, uh, curve and methodology. So, calculating sum of areas of all rectangles between 1 and a. Here is an example that is shown here. I have tried to draw rectangles like this. So, this is first rectangle, second rectangle, third rectangle. 
notice that as the curve 1 upon x becomes flatter, the error or the difference between the area of rectangle and the area in the under this curve reduces. On this side, you will notice that this much area is counted wrongly if I take the area under the curve as the area of this triangle, uh, this rectangle. But if the rectangle itself is smaller, then obviously the error will be less and less and less. That is the idea behind computing uh, the integral by estimating the sum of the areas of all such rectangles and more the number of rectangles the better it is. So, <coughs> how do I do that? How do I write a program to do that? Let us see what I want to do. I want to calculate the area of this rectangle, then add it to the area of this rectangle, then add it to the area of this rectangle, etcetera, etcetera. As many rectangles as I decide to form between 1 and a, because that is the definition of uh, log x. So, if I want to find out logarithm of the value, then I need to find out the sum of all rectangles between 1 and a, and now I will take an arbitrary rectangle. How do I estimate the area of that rectangle? Here is the observation. Consider ith rectangle. Say this is ith rectangle. Now, what is the width of that rectangle? Well, width is exactly same because I am dividing the area under this curve under a certain number of rectangles of equal width. This is by definition and therefore, the width is simply a minus 1 by n where n is the number of rectangles. What is a minus 1? a minus 1 is nothing but this complete interval. If n is 1000, the width of each rectangle will be a minus 1 by 1000. If n is 100, the width will be a minus 1 by 100, etcetera, etcetera. Now, I want to calculate the area of this rectangle. I have shaded this area here. How do I calculate the area? I need to know the width which I have already find out, found out. I need to find out the height. Now, height of this rectangle, how will I know? I need to calculate the value of this function f of x is equal to 1 upon x at this value of x. I first determine what is this x. So, what is the x coordinate of the beginning of the ith rectangle? This is my ith rectangle. Clearly, if I look at the numbers here, x is equal to 1 plus i minus 1 by w. So, this is my first rectangle. The x coordinate of the beginning of the first rectangle is 1 itself. So, it is 1 plus 0. So, if i is 1, 1 minus 1 into w is 0, I get the value correctly. What is the beginning point of the second rectangle? Since i is equal to 2, the formula will give me 1 plus i minus 1, which is 1 again into w, that is 1 plus w, which is correct. 1 is this point, I add w to it and I get the x coordinate of the second rectangle. Why we are discussing all this and why we should discuss all of this is to convince the students who may have understood the definition of log x, but may never have seen a numerical analysis procedure like this to estimate the value of log x by calculating the sum of areas and of the rectangle. So, it is worthwhile to explain this. So, we calculate x coordinate of ith rectangle in this fashion. Having found the x coordinate, it is easy to find out the height, because height is nothing but the value of this function at this value of x. This is explained in the next slide the height h of ith rectangle is nothing but 1 upon x. Why? Because the function is 1 upon x. So, if x is this coordinate, this height is 1 by x, because that is the value of this function at that point. And what is 1 by x? It is nothing but 1 upon 1 plus i minus 1 into w. Remember that x was originally calculated and was shown to be equal to 1 plus i minus 1 w. Consequently, for every rectangle, ith rectangle, I have very clearly the width which is w and the height which is h available in terms of the known quantities. Now, I look at the actual problem. How many rectangles should I have? Well, the observation is more the merrier. So, let me arbitrarily start with 1000 rectangles. The total width of rectangle is a minus 1 that is the whole range and the width of each rectangle is simply a minus 1 upon 1000. The x coordinate of the left side of ith rectangle, I am now recalling all the formulae that we have worked out, is x equal to 1 plus i minus 1 into w. 
and height of i rectangle is 1 upon x is equal to 1 upon 1 plus i minus 1 into w. What I have done here? I have consolidated all the formulations that we have explained to our students. To recap very briefly, I will go back four slides. I am trying to compute natural logarithm. My computer cannot calculate integrals. So, we make it compute areas of rectangles which are under the curve. And if I divide the area under the curve in large number of rectangles, I guess that my estimate of the sum of those rectangles should be quite close to the final integral value. This is my breakup of rectangles. I identify how will I calculate the area of the ith rectangle. First, I need to know its width which is fixed. Then I need to know its height for which I calculate the x coordinate of the left corner of the rectangle. Then I calculate the height by just using the function definition because it is nothing but the function value at that x coordinate. And finally, I conclude that these are the values that I have for ith rectangle. Why am I saying ith rectangle, ith rectangle? Well, we can now tell our students that look, we have a strong iterative mechanism whereby I can choose some variable like i or count and I can automatically vary that value by 1, 2, 3, 4, etcetera, etcetera and execute the kind of instruction that you want me to ex execute. Consequently, a pattern of instructions which need to be repeatedly executed can be specified very simply in my computer program. And consequently, to actually implement such an iteration, I need a variable which is equivalent to a counting variable. And I naturally have this i as the counting variable. Consequently, I can write a program to compute logarithm of a given value in this fashion. Let us see what this program does. It defines integer i, defines floating point x. It says area is 0 and it defines w as a variable which will represent the width. I read the value of x. Remember in the diagrams whatever we are showing a, 0, uh, 1 to a is actually log of a. So, 1 to any number x, basically whatever number we give, we are calculating the value of log x. So, we give the value of x here. Now, what we do? We calculate the width as x minus 1 by 1000. Where does this 1000 come from? Well, we have decided that we are dividing the entire area into 1000 rectangles. Please note that it will be a good idea to put a comment here that we are dividing this area into 1000 rectangles. Now, the fun starts. Having calculated the w, I want to calculate the areas of each one of the 1000 rectangles. So, I vary the value of i from 1 to 1000 including 1000 in steps of 1 which is what this for statement does. And for each value of i, what do I do? I simply calculate the area of ith rectangle which is w into 1 upon 1 plus i minus 1 star w. You can confirm that this entire thing is nothing but the area of ith rectangle. I add it to the previous value of area. So, as I go from rectangle to rectangle to rectangle, first I will calculate the area of first rectangle, put it in the value of area. Then I calculate the area of second rectangle by this formula and add it to the area. So, area is now a cumulative variable which will show me the cumulative value of all the area. Finally, when I complete this entire for loop, I have actually got the value of the total area which is my estimate of the logarithm of x. I simply print out a string called log of x and put the value of x and say is so much area. So, you can see how short and sweet a program can be to do this significant amount of computation. Incidentally, if I am not comfortable with the accuracy that I reach, uh, achieve, I can actually divide this into 10,000, 20,000, what could be the largest number? Instead of speculating, we can ask our students to experiment with this program, running it differently. You can actually, uh, in, in the lab assignment today, you have a sample program which calculates log x. It is a C program, uh, where you are required to quickly compile it and run it. It actually calculates the method, uh, the, the value of logarithm in three different ways. One it calculates the areas in this fashion, the other it calculates the areas backward, third it calculates the logarithm value by using a standard mathematical library function where the logarithm value is computed internally by C, most probably using a very similar method. Exactly the same concept extended can be used to iteratively compute the factorial of a number. After all, just as we 
calculated growing sum, we can find out a growing product. In the previous example, let us go back to the previous slide, we had area equal to 0 and we were constantly adding to that area in every iteration. So, it was a growing area or growing sum. For a factorial, where we have to calculate not sum of numbers, but product of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, we can calculate a growing product. Here is the program for that. I define n factorial as an integer variable, n as the number whose factorial I want to calculate and i as usual is my counting variable. I read the value of n, I set n factorial to 1, this is the initial value. Observe that factorial 0 is also 1. So, whatever be the value of n, the starting point is correctly 1. Now, for i equal to 1 to n, I do the following iteratively. I multiply the current value of n factorial by a value of i and assign that as the new value to n factorial. Consequently, first time n factorial will be 1, when i is 2, n factorial will become 2, then when i is 3, 2 will be multiplied by 3, it will become 6, when i is 4, 6 will be multiplied by 4, it will become 24 and so on. So, when I terminate this loop, I would have actually calculated the n factorial correctly. Notice that this particular way of computation, what is the care we have to take? Factorial value increases very rapidly. Iteration is an extremely powerful concept. What we have studied is iteration for a finite number of times. There could be iterations which I might want to continue till a certain condition is made. Apart from the for statement, there is another construct in C programming language called while, another still called repeat and all of these permit very generalized forms of iteration setup. Before going to discuss the while, I want to discuss another problem which is a very interesting problem. All of you are familiar with that problem actually, but the way it was introduced by my colleague Professor Ranade makes it far more interesting and I thought I will share that with you. Uh, I have already uh, uh, discussed this problem in this particular way with the students of programming here and they all like uh, the, the uh, special peculiar nature of this. Because later on you will find that you actually know this problem, but in a different way. Problem presented here is called the Hemchandra's problem. Hemchandra was actually a 12th century poet, I think 1115 to 1150 or something, but in those days you could be a poet, a mathematician and a philosopher and a doctor all simultaneously. He was one of those intellectual giants who was not just a poet, but also was a great mathematician. This problem I have stated, in fact, Professor Ranade himself did this restatement in a slightly different way so that all of us can understand. What is the problem here? This is not Hemchandra's problem, by the way, but it is a similar statement. It says, I want to build a wall of length 8 feet and I have bricks which are 2 feet long and also I have bricks which are 1 foot long. In how many ways can I lay the bricks so that I fill the 8 feet length? That is a very generic question. Obviously, there is more than one way, in fact many more ways than one way. Here are some examples. I can take 4 bricks of 2 feet each, okay, I complete 8 feet. I can take 8 bricks of 1 feet, 1 foot each and I can complete the length. I can take 3 bricks of 2 feet each and 2 bricks of 1 foot each, making it 8. And this way, there are umpteen possibilities. What is the reason, what is our interest in knowing how many different ways I can fill in the 8 feet? This brings us to the original problem which Hemchandra was tackling, which was a slightly different problem. Since he was a poet, the actual problem was designing a poetic meter. Uh, those of us who are not well versed with music, and I assure you I am one of them, may not understand the uh, intricacies of the musical poetic meter systems, etc. But suffice it to say that these poetic meters have a short syllabus and a long syllabus. Roughly a short syllable represents one beat and a long syllable represents two beats. This is very common in the poetic meters. All that Hemchandra is asking is, how many ways are there of filling 8 beats? He had this peculiar problem. He wanted to know in how many different ways I can put together short and long syllables such that I can make 8 beats. 
Here is just a arbitrary example of a poetic meter. In fact, uh, these lines that you see here are from a very uh, well known Sanskrit poem, Ya Kundendu Tushar Ahara Dhavala, and these are the representative uh, long beats and short beats as you see there. Coming back to the mathematical problem, Hemchandra solved this problem in a very peculiar way. He said, by the method of Pingal, Pingal was a Rushi many years, many centuries before Hemchandra incidentally. And Pingal had said that to solve this kind of problems, it is enough to observe that the last beat is long or short. So, no, note what he is saying. Let us go back two slides again to our brick thing. What he is saying is to figure out how many such ways I can fill up the 8 feet wall, if I want to find out how many such ways, I only need to observe the last brick, whether it is long or short. If I can observe that and concentrate that, there is an easy way of counting all these number of ways. Well, how do you, how do, you do that? We will see that solution, but it is worthwhile to note that Pingala was a mathematician and poet from 500 AD. So, what is important here and I want to emphasize this and I want you to emphasize this to students is Hemchandra is giving credit to someone who lived hundreds of years before him. Contrast it with the problems that we face where our students routinely copy programs from either books or others and do not even mention it. The moral of the Hemchandra solution in my opinion is that it says this message, copy if necessary and if permitted, but always give credit. In fact, why I emphasize this point is that in our endeavor to create open source contents through collaborative communities, there will be occasions when each of us will be submitting something. There is a possibility that we see that some material in some particular place is extremely useful and it is perfectly all right for us to say that we submit that material in open source after taking due permission of course. However, it is also equally important to say that we acknowledge the creator of that particular piece of information or knowledge. So, copy if necessary and if permitted, but always give credit is a non-numerical moral of the Hemchandra solution of this problem. Let us of course, continue with the discussion on the numerical aspect of the solution. So, here is a some description of the solution. Please note the original problem was find out in how many different ways I can construct a 8 bit meter. So, Hemchandra says that using method of Pingla, I divide the 8 bit patterns into two classes. One class which has a short last beat, another class which has a long short last beat. The Pingla says just observe the last beat. Now, I do not know how many such patterns will be there with one short bit and how many such patterns will be there with one long bit. But I divide my problem into two classes. I say S is the class of 8 bit patterns with short last bit and L is the class of 8 bit patterns with long last bit. And now I conclude a very important observation. Each 8 bit pattern is either in class L or in class S. There cannot be anything else because I have only two types of bit, short and long and any pattern can either end in a short bit or can end in a large bit. So, therefore, long or short are the only two possible classes. So, while I do not know how many patterns are in L and how many patterns are in S, I know for sure that the total patterns in L plus total patterns in S together is the total 8 bit patterns that I can have. But now I look further and I see something very interesting. What is S? S is after all 8 bit patterns with short last beat. Consequently, I take all possible 7 bit patterns and put a short beat at the end. I will get the classes. Classes cannot have anything else because short beat appended at the end means all 7 bit patterns can only take a short beat because total beats have to be 8. Now, I see what is L. L has a long last beat that means it has a value 2. So, obviously, if I want 8 bit patterns with long last bit, then if I take all 6 bit patterns and for each of those I append a long bit, then I will get the total number of patterns in the class L. 
So, notice that what is being done is I first define the possible number of uh, uh, patterns in S and L class and I know that each 8 bit pattern is either in L class or classes. Then I further define what is S and what is L in terms of 7 and 6 bit patterns. It is very obvious that you can continue this to define 7 bit patterns in terms of 6 and 5 bit patterns, 6 bit patterns in terms of 5 and 4 bit patterns and so on. To conclude so far, since S plus L, the class S is number of patterns with 7 bits. Please note that all 7 bit patterns plus short bit attended is S and therefore all 7 bit patterns is the number of patterns in classes. So, the number of patterns in classes is number of patterns with 7 bits. Number of patterns in class L is number of patterns with 6 bits. The 8 bit patterns number is nothing but equal to the number of patterns in S and number of patterns in L and therefore number of 7 bit patterns plus number of 6 bit patterns. This is in fact the phenomenal recurrence relation as you and I know it has been determined by Pingala's method. And this can be continued till you reach a level where you are talking about 1 bit patterns and 2 bit patterns. Algebraically, Hemchandra says that the number of patterns with n bits can be represented as h8 equal to h7 plus h6, where h7 is 7 bit uh, beat patterns and h6 is pattern with 6 bits. In general, hn is equal to hn minus 1 plus hn minus 2. All of us are familiar with this recurrence relation, I will come back to you later. But does this help us to compute h8? In order to compute h8, we must know h7 and h6. In order to compute H7, we must know H6 and H5. In order to compute H6, we must know H5 and H4, etc., etc. How can we reconcile to this situation and put the computations in some form where we can use the powerful instructions of iteration, conditional, etc., etc., that we have learned? So, here is one way. The idea of the algorithm is I start ulta. I do not come down from 8 bits, 7 bits, 6 bits, but I say I let me see 1. So, how many patterns are there with just 1 bit? Number of patterns with 1 bit is only 1 because only short bit can come there. Remember long bit occupies 2 slots. How many patterns are there in H2 that number with 2 bits? There are 2. Why? I can have either 2 short bits or 1 long bit. So, there are 2 possibilities. I continue the same way, H3. According to my recursion formula, H3 is equal to H2 plus H1. That means the number of patterns possible with 3 bits has to be exactly 2 plus 1, which is 3. I can indeed verify that. Consider quite independently how many 3 bit, uh, three bit patterns you can have. You can have 3 bits of SSS, you can have 3 bits of LS, or you can have 3 bits of SNL, and there is no other possibility. So, this indeed is correct. Continuing this way, H4 is computed as H3 plus H2, which is 5, H5 is computed as this 5 plus 3, 8, and so on, so forth, when H8 is 34. What is interesting is to see the sequence of numbers which emerges 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. First, we discuss the technical information program to calculate the number of bits. So, I take n, I want to calculate h n. What I do is, I set initial value of one term called h previous, initial value for another term called h current. So, these two represent the two past s, h previous and h current, 1 and 2. And I want to calculate h next, which I have defined as integer. Now, please note that h next will always be given as h current plus h previous. So, I can set up an iteration. Observe the way the iteration is set up. For int i equal to 3, i less than equal to n, i plus plus. There is a small squiggle and at the cost of some digression, I would like to mention this. Ordinarily, I would have written this for loop as i equal to 3, i less than equal to n, i plus plus. When I say int i equal to 3, what I am doing is, I am not only initializing i to 3, but I am also defining i as an integer variable. Why am I defining here? Could I not have defined here? Of course, I could have defined it here. 
the difference which we shall emphasize at some point it could be state, uh, stated here or at a later time. I pre uh, personally prefer to uh, describe uh, the scoping of variable names at a later time. Effectively what we have to tell our students is that if I define I here, the value of I will be known or will be usable throughout my program. However, if I define a variable inside an iteration like this or for that matter inside any block, then the existence of that variable logically is limited only to that block. That means, whatever is the value of I here, that value is not observable or uh, uh, manipulatable outside this unless of course, I have declared another I. Indeed, I can have two variables called I, one declared here, one declared here. The one declared here could have values here, but the moment another declaration comes inside that block, the value of I is determined by what happens inside. Anyway, that is a slight digression. Coming back to this iteration, all that I am doing is, I am calculating the sum of H previous plus H current to calculate H next. Observe that for I equal to 3, H next will give me H 3. But in the next iteration, I want to calculate H 4, for which I need to push H next to H current and H current to H previous. This is what we call preparation for next iteration and this is what we are doing. We take the current value of H and push it to H previous and we take the H next value and push it to H current. So, we are actually having a moving window. At the starting point, I had H previous and H current. Using this, I found out next. Now, I push the H next to H uh, current and H current to H previous and go over to the next value of R. When I execute this iteration n times, the then value of H next will represent H of n or the Hemchandra number of the nth order. I output that value. This is incidentally a very, very interesting example of solving a recurrence relation by putting it into an iterative form in this fashion. In the earlier examples that we saw, we, were, we had identified a block which could be repeatedly executed and we were having something new every time that block was executed. Either a new value was read from input which was being compared with the current maximum or we were using the iterative count i to multiply it with some product so that we could find factorial. Here, we have two sort of values which both of which change in every iteration leading to this kind of result. Here are comments which Professor Ranade had made and I entirely agree with this. This is mathematics from poetry. The series indeed is very interesting. It represents the number of petals in many flowers. It represents the ratio of consecutive terms which tends to a limit. All of you would recognize this is called what? Golden ratio and these numbers are commonly known as Fibonacci numbers. So, what we, we learnt in our younger days as Fibonacci series was actually, it is in fact called Hemchandra Gopala series and you can again, you can refer to either Wikipedia or any number of other literature, where uh, it is conclusively, conclusively shown that Fibonacci himself learnt possibly about these things, when he was learning maths from some Arab scholars who had learnt it from India. Clearly, Hemchandra lived before Fibonacci, so the origin of the series which we now call Fibonacci series, he has come from our land, where thousands of you are attending to this course. It is a matter to be proud of. But as far as we are concerned in this course, the objective of this discussion was to show that how well known mathematical problems involving recurrence relations could be implemented using iteration. I will briefly go back to the previous slide, which indicates that this kind of iteration with two terms successively being pushed back and back and a new value computed will eventually give me the correct uh, calculation for the uh, recurrence relation and I can calculate H n for any n. H n does not increase as rapidly as factorial increases, but it also increases fast. Consequently, if I want to find out H n for some very large value of n, I may land up into a problem of not having the ability to store the final result which comes up after uh, uh, successive summations. This is a problem that we will keep reminding ourselves about and there will be some exercises that, that will put, where you will actually 
uh, work out things on on the errors both errors of rounding off for floating point numbers and errors of having numbers going way past the capability of or the limit of representation for integer numbers. Last we will discuss the Newton Raphson method. Uh, this is the method which is used to calculate roots of a function any function f of x a general function. I want to briefly discuss this. Uh, what is the root? The root is nothing but a value of x such that f of x is 0. The Newton Raphson method there are multiple ways of finding out the roots for example. Incidentally roots of a quadratic a x square plus b x plus c which is a problem so often dealt with in the introductory programming courses but it is computed differently because there are explicit formulae to calculate the roots of a x square plus b x plus c. However, if you have a general function it is extremely difficult to calculate roots in such arbitrary manner because there may not be an exact analytical solution. So, we have a numerical solution and what is the numerical solution? Well, the numerical solution depends upon our ability to find out f of x and also f dash of x that is the derivative of it. So, if both these functions are known and defined and if an initial good guess is available then it is possible to find the root of f of x using a numerical method. We will illustrate the Newton Raphson method by choosing a function arbitrarily as the square root of some value k. So, for example, we define the function f of x as x square minus k. Notice that x square minus k equal to 0 means x square is equal to k and x is equal to under root of k. That is how we will find out the square root of k. So, we have defined this function f of x accordingly. Having defined this function, we know that its derivative f dash x is simply 2 x. So, for once we have a well defined function f of x and a well defined derivative function f dash of x. Further, we observe that f x and f dash x can be calculated very easily. That is, if I give a value of x, say 5.3, I can calculate 5.3 square minus k and I can also calculate 2 into 5.3. So, calculations is very trivial and simple, but that is not the point. The point is, while I can do 2 or 3 arithmetic operations to calculate this, what I want to find out is the root of this equation and it is not very clear to me how will I find a root. The root is a point on x axis where the function crosses x axis. Assuming that the function has at least one real root and it is always true for this function by the way. For any constant k where the equation x square equal to k always has a real value. In fact, there is exactly one root. So, how can you calculate that? The Newton Raphson method says that first start with some initial guess. The initial guess could be arbitrary because the real line stretches from minus infinity to plus infinity. It is well known in the case of this function that the initial guess of x 0 equal to 1 always works. This has in fact been proven. We do not go into the proofs and all, but we now illustrate the Newton Raphson method to some details. So, the question is going back here, if I have the function f x defined, if I have f dash x defined and if I have an initial guess x 0 equal to 1, I want to set up an iterative method by which I can constantly improve the initial guess value and bring it closer to the real root. This is the starting point where we denote it by x i. Our idea is that if this is the function, this is an arbitrary starting point, I would like this starting point or initial guess to come as close as possible to this function because this is where the root is. So, in short the point A is known, point B which is here can be calculated easily because that is nothing but the value of the function at f x. Now, I want to get a better estimate of the root. So, I approximate the function by tangent at the point B. In short this is my representation of the function at this point. What is tangent? Tangent can be easily calculated because I know f dash x as well. And wherever this tangent intercepts x axis, I will treat this to be a point closer to my root, which is obviously so. So, original estimate was this. 
I would like to get this estimate. And at this point, I will again like to do that, again like to do that, etc. You can very clearly see that such iterations will eventually lead me to the desired result. This is a formulation. For example, I approximate f by the tangent c, which is intercept on x-axis. The point c, let us say the point c has coordinates xi plus 1, comma 0, because it is on x-axis. My ambition is to calculate xi plus 1 given xi, given the value of fx and given the value of f dash x. What is f dash xi, which is the derivative, is nothing but the slope ab by ac, ab by ac, okay? because that defines the slope here, which is f of xi divided by xi minus xi plus 1. Consequently, we can calculate xi plus 1 as equal to xi minus f of xi divided by f dash xi. Observe that what we have done is, we had a well-defined function and a well-defined derivative of that function. We took an initial guess and from that we improved that guess to calculate xi plus 1. Since xi plus 1 is also a guess and since the value of the function is not 0 at this point, I have not yet found a root. But what I can do? I can do exactly what I did with xi with xi plus 1 now. And this is what renders the problem completely amenable to an iterative solution. I can keep finding out a new xi plus 1 from a given xi, the xi plus 2, xi plus 3 and so on. And iteratively, I can approach the root. In the diagram, the root is here. Of course, it should be very obvious to you that initially my movement towards the root may be very rapid. Afterwards, I will move very slowly, but eventually I will always reach the root. This is generally known as the newton raphson method. Why I am introducing it so elaborately is because you will find that your first year students would not have heard of newton raphson method, at least not all of them. So it is useful to introduce newton raphson method in a computational context like this and later on uh, teach your students to write a computer program to implement these iterations. Thank you very much.